We pray that this morning you would speak to our hearts. Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. You are the one that we want to focus on this morning. You are the one we want to adore. You are the one that we want to meet with. So, Father, we pray that as we meet with you and as we meet with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is here present among us, that our complete attention would be on you. Nothing in this room, nothing outside of the walls of the church, nothing would distract us from hearing from you and meeting with you this morning. Father, open our eyes to your word. Help us to have a better understanding of what it says, but not just so that we gain more information, but so that our lives can be transformed and that we would walk out of here this morning being more and more like Jesus. Father, quiet our hearts. May you be glorified. May we worship you this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. For most of you, anyway, here, right? As I started off last week, I, I shared a little bit about Punxsutawney Phil with you. And I, I left you with some very important words regarding Punxsutawney Phil. Don't believe a word that he says. Uh, early spring, <laughs> looks like it's a continuation of winter, but uh, it's, I'm glad that you're here with us this morning to worship. And it is beautiful, I, you must admit, that it is beautiful to see the snow falling. Um, some of you may hate snow, I love snow. I love to drive in it, I love to see it, I love to experience it. And it's a constant reminder when that fresh fallen snow is coming down. It's just beautiful. It's white. It's clean. And it's just a reminder of how Jesus washes our sins whiter than snow. And so you can find beauty. See, I don't have to shovel it right now either. So that's another reason I love it. So, um, and even if I did, I've got some boys that could take care of that for me. But uh, I do love the snow and, uh, a little bit slippery coming in this morning. I hope none of you had problems getting in. But uh, to those that are watching online, we want to welcome you. You're missing out. It's beautiful here to worship together, but I'm glad you're able to watch us online this morning as well. So uh, we're starting a new series, and this is one that I'm excited about. I'm, I, you'll find that I say that about every series we start. I'm excited to start it. Um, this is countercultural. And we're going to go on a journey through Matthew chapter 5 over the next eight weeks of what it means to live in a counter-cultural way. And when you look at society, when you see the culture around us, you'll find out very quickly that culture tells us to live one way, and then when we look at God's Word, it tells us that we should live in another. And that creates a tension for us, because hopefully... As followers of Jesus and as those that are coming here to worship, we want to not just know more about God, but we want to live for God and we want to be in a relationship with God. But we also live in this fallen, very sinful world. And it creates a tension within us. We want to live a certain way. We know that God has called us to live in a certain way, and yet the world pressures us and wants us to follow what it has to do and what it has to say. The series is going to be based on Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and it's my prayer that through this series we'll not only discover the depth and meaning of Jesus' teaching, but we'll f- discover practical ways that we can apply it to our own life and we can put it into action. When we look at the words of Jesus and when we take them and we believe them and we apply them, we realize that his gospel, his message compels us to confront the culture around us. The problem is that apart from Jesus, each one of us has fallen, each one of us is sinful, and we're no different from the world around us. And yet Jesus has called us to live radically different. Now we know this in our heads. We may even experience this in our hearts, 
but the difficulty is to move from a place in our lives where this is just knowledge to where it becomes reality in how we live. We live out our faith in countercultural ways. So that's where we're going in this series. That's what our heart's desire is, that when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, when we look at the Beatitudes, we see a stunningly descriptive account of what it's like when we surrender our lives fully to Jesus, and we live by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and we have a kingdom-centered life. We think of the Beatitudes, we think of them as an idealistic set of sayings, that these are things that we should attain to, things that we should live out in our life. And for an unbeliever, they're great kind of a moral compass to follow, but if you don't know Jesus, you're never going to be able to live these out. But for the believer, the one who is a follower of Jesus and one of his disciples, the Beatitudes are part of a process of becoming more and more like Jesus. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, during the, w- the weeks of this series, we're going to unlock a new beatitude each week. We're going to discover the kingdom meaning. We're going to kind of compare and contrast it to the worldview. And we're, dis- we're going to discover some application of how we can apply this to our life. And we can live in a countercultural way. Now, there are eight beatitudes that we're going to study. Each statement can leave us a little bit perplexed. It may seem like what Jesus is saying is even a little bit contradictory. But as we look at the Beatitudes, I want us to remember it's not a list, uh, a to-do list. Some of you have to-do lists, and your list might be quite long, and it feels good to go down through that to-do list and mark things off as you accomplish them. It's not a checklist that we've got to cross off, but it's a lifestyle of full surrender to Jesus. It's a completely countercultural, renewed thinking way of life. In Matthew, uh, verses, the first couple chapters, and in 3 and 4, we, start, we see the start of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus is starting to preach, he's starting to teach, he's starting to call his disciples. He's gone throughout Galilee, he's teaching in the synagogues, he's preaching the good news of the kingdom, he's healing every disease and sickness, and news about Jesus starts to spread rapidly through the area. People come to hear Jesus teach. They come to be healed of their diseases. They're looking for relief from their pain, and they're looking for freedom from demonic oppression. And Jesus healed. Early on in Jesus' ministry, he goes around and he heals people, and he continues to heal and preach, and large crowds continue to follow him. More and more people want to come and hear Jesus, and they want to come and be healed. They want to experience what is taking place. And Jesus goes from place to place, from town to town, all across the region. And people follow him everywhere. And let's look at Matthew chapter 5. This is where we're going to pick up this morning. This is speaking of Jesus. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began teaching them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice what Jesus does here. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had a chair, have you ever seen a preacher sit down and preach? I wouldn't be able to do it. I have to walk around. But Jesus sat down on a mountainside, probably so he could see the crowds that were gathering around him. He's up on a little bit of a a mountainside and he's teaching and he's starting to preach here. And the disciples come and he begins to teach them. And it's directed toward the disciples, but there are so many people around him. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When we think of the word poor, we often approach it from a financial angle. It almost always has a negative connotation. To be poor means to lack. It means that we do not possess all that we need. Most of you have probably already received your W-2s. I'll let you know my taxes are already done and filed, which is incredible. You too? Kind of puts a whole new spin on this, doesn't it, right? 
To be poor means that we lack something. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. When someone is labeled as poor, either by their own standards or the standards of culture and society, there is something that they are lacking that they do not have on their own. Being poor means you don't have much. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. How can you be blessed by being poor? But it's important to look, when Jesus speaks of blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not talking about a financial situation. So what is the meaning of this phrase? What's the meaning of Jesus' statement? Poor in spirit means we recognize our poverty before God. It's an attitude toward ourselves in which we know and affirm that we have not lived a life to which God has called us, and that without him, we cannot do so now. Being poor in spirit recognizes that I am spiritually bankrupt, that you are spiritually bankrupt, that we can bring nothing of value to God, and we stand before God in great need. Scripture says that everything we have to offer Him, everything that we do, our righteous acts, our good deeds are as filthy rags. There's nothing that you or I can do before God that's going to make us look good before Him. We're spiritually bankrupt before God. Everything we have to offer Him is as filthy rags. Being poor in spirit is true humility. And this is truly countercultural. It goes completely against our self affirming, self promoting, self centered society. But God has called us to completely trust Him to live for Him, to trust Him and not ourselves, while the world calls us to trust ourselves and to doubt God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, most of you probably know this verse, but let's look at it again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Society says, trust yourself. Trust yourself. Do what is best for yourself You know what to do. Trust yourself in everything. God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. A follower of Jesus recognizes that his or her position is not based on good works. It's not based on devotion. It's not based on spiritual pride or ability. One's position is based solely on what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And this is one of the differences between Christianity and religion. Religion states that you and I must do certain things to obtain the favor of God. We must live a certain way. We must perform certain tasks. Every religion in the world has some aspect of this theme. We must do something to earn God's favor. And I'd say even within the church, we do this at times. Did you read your Bible? Did you pray? Did you sign up to serve? Did you come to church during the big snowstorm? Are you living a good moral life? And it becomes a checklist of things that we've got to do and to finish. And these are good things, church, don't get me wrong. But if those are the basis of our identity and our relationship with God, we are not poor in spirit. Rather, we are spiritually proud. We can bring nothing before God. Being poor in spirit is the primary mark of a person who walks in relationship with Jesus. Spiritual humility is a distinguishing mark of a follower of Jesus. And if we don't understand this very first beatitude, and if we don't live this one out, we will miss out on all the others. This is the keystone. This is that center cog on which all else turns. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's ask ourselves then, what is the blessing that God gives to those that are poor in spirit? Look at verse 3. I'll wait for you to find it. Blessed are the poor in spirit for... You guys have your Bibles open? Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. What's the blessing? The kingdom of... The kingdom of heaven. The blessing for those that are poor in spirit is the kingdom of heaven. Now, heaven is a future blessing. 
We're not in heaven yet, are we? Menominee's pretty close, right? (laughs) Come on. But we're not in heaven yet. Heaven is a future blessing. We long for the return of Jesus. We long for eternity and spending forever with Him in heaven. Heaven is a future blessing. But Jesus didn't say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't indicate a future blessing here. He says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a present tense promise. That's for now. And when we look at the other Beatitudes in the weeks to come, we'll see that all those blessings are future-based. They will be. Theirs will be. They're coming, but they haven't come yet. And Jesus says, the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the poor in spirit recognize that they bring nothing before God that can taste. Uh, Those that recognize they bring nothing before God, they can now taste the greatest blessing of heaven, which is the presence of God himself here and now. Out of our complete lack, out of our spiritual deficiencies, out of our brokenness, out of our inabilities, in our spiritual humility, we serve a God who declares, I am with you. I am all you need. I am more than sufficient for everything you face. Jesus is with us now. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. Isaiah the prophet says, For this is what the high and lofty one says, speaking of God. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God dwells in a high and holy place, but he also dwells among us. And the challenge is for us to come before God empty-handed with a deep recognition that we have absolutely nothing to offer Him. Church, are we coming before God in true and sincere humility? Are we poor in spirit before the Lord? Or are we spiritually proud? Because in all reality, apart from what Jesus Christ has done for each one of us, we have nothing to offer God. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. I want to look at five countercultural characteristics or outcomes of being poor in spirit this morning. The first one is this. We have realigned expectations. We have realigned expectations. When we are poor in spirit, we proclaim, I owe God everything and I can give him nothing. God doesn't owe me. God doesn't owe you. He doesn't owe us a thing. And yet, by the grace of God, He has given us everything. We realize God doesn't owe us anything, and yet He has freely given us everything. I love what Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says, God's divine power, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Peter is saying that when we know Jesus, when we know Jesus, and it's not just a knowledge of Jesus, but it's a heart relationship with Jesus, God has given us divine power, and He has given us everything we need for this life, and for godliness through our relationship with Jesus Christ who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And that's a realigned expectation that we cannot live this life that God has called us to do in our own strength and in our own power. But because we know Jesus Christ, God has given us everything that we need to live the way that he has called us to live. You catch the gravity of that. That when we are called to live a countercultural life, a life that is completely different than the culture around us, we cannot do that in our own strength. But because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have the power to do so. Because we have Him living in and through us. So 
we have realigned expectations. We realize that we can't do anything, we can't give anything to God, and yet God, who doesn't need to give us anything, has given us everything through Jesus. We experience revitalized prayer. When we have nothing, and when we can offer nothing, we recognize the depth of our need, the great depth of our need. Everything we do and ask comes from a place of complete and total dependence on God. And so when we pray, when we ask God for things, when we ask of God, we ask with an intent, with purpose, and with great faith. And prayer takes on a whole new reality. True humility, being poor in spirit, generates a revitalized prayer life because all we can do is come before the Father and ask. Jesus told a, a powerful story, a powerful account, and it's recorded for us in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 11 through 14, Jesus is with his disciples, and, and he says this, the Pharisee stood up. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Being poor in spirit brings about a revitalized prayer life. We have two examples here. We have the Pharisee, the religious person who was doing the right things. Maybe even saying the right things. If you go back and you look at that very first part, he says, I'm not like the others. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. I am a good person. And yet he was spiritually proud. He was not poor in spirit. It became a religion of doing things to glorify God and to earn favor with God, but his heart was far from God. And the tax collector from all outward appearances, one who would have been reviled, one who would have been despised, one who would have been considered a cheat and a thief and a liar. is so poor in spirit, such a sense of true spiritual humility that as he enters into the presence of God, he can't even lift his head, but he prays and says, God, I am a sinner. And he beat his breast and declares that he's not worthy. And Jesus says that that man, the tax collector, went home justified before God, for he who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And when we are poor in spirit, we will have a revitalized prayer life. We'll be like the tax collector, recognizing our position, recognizing who God is, and we will come to him and ask with intent, with purpose, and with great faith. And prayer takes on a whole new reality. Third characteristic for us to look at this morning is a replenished strength. What do you do when you face hardships, trials, and difficulties? The world states that when times get tough, you've never heard that saying? The tough get going. When times get tough, the tough get going. Yet being proud is something that God strongly opposes. Being poor in spirit before God is contrary to our human nature and contrary to what the world tells us to do. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Church, God gives grace to the humble. He helps those who are humble in spirit. But being poor in spirit may seem like the last plan that you'd ever try when facing difficult situations. We're Americans. When things get tough, we don't back down. 
we dig a little harder, dig a little deeper, we try a little harder. When we face difficulty, we can do it in our own strength. And God says, humble yourself. Psalm 147 verse 6 says, The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. The Lord sustains the humble. And when we are poor in spirit, when we face great difficulty in this life, when we face trials and adversity, we humble ourselves before the Lord and we ask, God, I can't do this in my own strength. The Lord sustains the humble. Whatever you face, you can make it through when you humble yourself before the Lord. The fourth characteristic is a renewed love. Renewed love. Being poor in spirit and loving others go hand in hand. The spiritually proud want others to serve them, whereas the poor in spirit look for ways to express their love to God and to others. 1 John, the apostle, reminds us that we have been called to love one another because God first loved us and we have received his message. We have received the good news of Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus, we should be more and more like him. Again, this is a, a, a countercultural calling. The world does not love. The world has a twisted idea of love. It's warped, it's distorted, it's upside down. 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 says, Believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what we're to do. We're to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're to love one another as He commanded us. Those who obey His commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. We believe in the name of Jesus and we are to love one another as he has commanded us. The world knows that we are Christians by our love. Loving others is a bold countercultural move. We all experience broken relationships even within the church and the world can't fix broken relationships. Maybe you're wondering this morning if a relationship can ever be mended, if it could ever be restored, if it can ever be reconciled. I think we all at times experience broken relationships. The church, I want to challenge you. I believe that every relationship can be restored. Every relationship can be reconciled. Even within the body of Christ, there's no better place to start than in the body of Christ. Peter continues, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He says, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Think about this. The greatest story of reconciliation the world has ever seen is the story of God reconciling us through His Son, Jesus Christ. I love Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature... God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's the greatest story of reconciliation the world has ever seen. And when we humble ourselves, God gives us a renewed love for others. Church, it's sad when there is conflict within the body. It is sad when brothers and sisters in Christ have differences to the point where they are no longer loving each other. If we are to truly be countercultural, we must love one another. We must love one another. We must put others above ourselves. We must be poor in spirit. We must humble ourselves before the Lord. And we must love Him. And we must love one another. 
How are we any different from the world around us if we don't even love each other? We must have a renewed sense of love. And the last characteristic, the last characteristic that I believe is a mark of a countercultural Christian is reflective worship. Reflective worship. The poor in spirit are constantly dependent on God for everything. Church, we know we are sinful. We know that our motives are impure. We know that our hearts are wicked and far from God, except by the grace of God, we have been saved and set free. And this type of countercultural response leads us to a place of reflective worship. When we recognize who we are apart from Jesus Christ, and we recognize what Jesus has done for us, it leads us to reflective worship. We recognize our impoverished position before God. When we accept the gift of Jesus, we respond in worship. The kind of humility produced by the gospel is not a one-time thing. It forever changes the way we relate to God. True humility before the Lord results in heartfelt, reflective worship. We recognize we are sinners and we stand in awe before God. And the result every time is worship. Whether it's personal or whether it's corporate, we respond in worship. And our worship is offered in humility before God. When we understand our position before God, when we are poor in spirit, worship becomes even greater in our lives. Isaiah 29, verse 19, Isaiah says, Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. What a powerful statement Isaiah makes. He says, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Why? Because they recognize their position before an almighty God. And when we recognize our position before an almighty God, we are moved to worship Him. Being poor of spirit is part of becoming like Jesus. It is our participation in the life of Jesus. And Jesus, church, is our greatest example. And the way and life of Jesus is truly countercultural. We are all called to be poor in spirit. We're all called to live a countercultural life. And it's not easy to do, is it? Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you. We come before you and we know that you have called us to live a countercultural life. We know that you have called us to live like you. And Jesus, we, we, we don't have what it takes to live the life that you've called us to live. We don't have the power to do it on our own. Jesus, you, you freely give. And so, Father, we ask that Jesus would give us everything that we need, that we do not have, so that we may live more like him. And we trust you. And we wait on you. And we look to you. Father, we know the depth of our spiritual poverty. We know what you have done for us. And we know that in you we find all that we will ever need. We pray that we would be poor in spirit before you. And we know that the kingdom of heaven is ours when we are poor in spirit before you, which means that, Father, you are always with us. Your Holy Spirit dwells within us and we have everything that we need to live the life that you've called us to live. And Lord, you have called us to live a countercultural life, a life that is completely different than the world around us. So Father, we pray that each and every day we would come to you and we would ask you to help us live a life that glorifies you, that 
goes against what our culture says. And that by doing so, Father, give us opportunities as followers of Jesus to share the hope and the truth of Jesus with a lost, hurting, and dying world. Make us more like Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said.